Welcome to everybody for this uh, Global Virus Network forefront of our Logic COVID-19 webinar series. And uh, before introducing Dr. Marianne Koopman, and it's really a great pleasure to have Marianne with us today, just want to make a very few points as usual regarding the Global Virus Network because not all of the attendees are familiar with it. So just to emphasize that this network, which has been created by Bob Gallo with uh, Billy Hall and also the late um, uh, Rolf, uh, Kurt, uh, Reinhard Kurt, sorry, uh, has been created in 2011. Uh, and the main point is that really this is a science-driven network, an independent network really based on scientists who really merge their expertise uh, to the fight, to fight obviously against infectious disease and also obviously now there's very much on uh, COVID-19. So the activities of the GVN are really uh, a blend, I would say, of uh, research. Uh, we have annual meetings, uh, we have a number of joint activities between the scientists it's about education and training, increasingly so, uh, in particular with the recent creation of the GVN Academy. And it's about advocacy. It's about expertise. It's about providing the best expertise for all viruses, not only for COVID-19, all viruses. You can find a lot of information on our website, which has been very much reorganized. You have also a web page which uh, with a daily update on the variants, on questions and answers, on the vaccines. And uh, these webinars are really a part of the activities, obviously, to really uh, enhance communication and knowledge. And in this context, it's really a great pleasure to welcome Marion Koopman. Marion has a very interesting track of veterinary medicine. She has been educated in the Netherlands. I'm not going to go into detail. She has had a lot of uh, awards, recognition, and important positions. Sufficient to say that she's presently the head of the Erasmus Department of Viral Science in Rotterdam. She is the head of a GVN center, and this is obviously very important for us. Her work has always been focused on uh, the uh, foodborne transmission, zoonotic virus infections, and really unraveling the modes of transmission of viruses among animals, between animals and humans, and among humans. A lot of uh, genomics-based studies. Uh, she is the coordinator of several very important European projects, such as the so-called VEO, for the warning of the risk of emerging disease. Uh, another one which is a prepare to harmonize large-scale clinical research studies on infectious disease, and also a dedicated COVID-19 project which is linked to prepare. She's the director of a WHO Cooperation Center at the Erasmus and scientific director, director of emerging disease of the Netherlands Center for One Health. So Marianne has really a very important role, especially in the context of these pandemics. And we really look forward, Marianne, to your lecture. Thank you for being with us. You are on mute. Thank you, uh, Christian, for your kind uh, words. Um, and um, yeah, so what I decided to put together is a short presentation based on a topic that uh, keeps popping up, I guess, in many headlines, and that is the origins of SARS-CoV. And what I will focus on is uh, a walk through the studies that were done as part of the first phase of the WHO uh, convened uh, um, scientific mission. So uh, it's important, I think, to realize how this was put together. And it is uh, our assignment has been to do a 
uh, to, to try and get a better understanding of what exactly happened at the start of this uh, pandemic. Uh, and that started with, in stage one, phase one studies, a detailed reconstruction of the current knowledge on the first reported uh, cases in China. So really our first phase of this work was to try and understand everything that had been done, but also listing a series of studies to, uh, to uh, try and understand potentially missed um, circulation. So that was done through a series of uh, studies that were developed in over the past year, uh, focusing either on human epidemiology, on animals and the environment, on virology and the, the data uh, sharing and infrastructure, and uh, on uh, by talking to and visiting uh, uh, all the key players that had been involved in the initial uh, response in Wuhan. Now it's important to realize that uh, the, this work has been handicapped by the whole uh, pandemic itself in the sense that our first uh, months of work have been online uh, because it simply was not possible to, to travel. Um, and also once we uh, were able to go to China, um, the first weeks were spent in a strict hotel quarantine. And what you're looking at here is the daily visit for the health checks, uh, because we really were not uh, able to get out of our hotel rooms uh, the first two weeks. So this is the first two weeks of the uh, WHO mission. Uh, and I'm mentioning it because it is, uh, as everyone knows who's done international studies, um, it is a handicap to not be able to do the normal, you know, get togethers, uh, including some socializing to, to discuss um, in a more informal setting. So that's just setting the scene for you to understand. So um, in, uh, the, in preparation to this, we have uh, developed a series of studies um, uh, focusing on getting a better understanding of the epidemiology in humans. So that was, we asked for a review of uh, notifications of influenza-like illness and uh, severe acute respiratory illness in the months before uh, the pandemic became, uh, was detected, first cases were detected, and in comparison with data from previous years. Um, we also asked for retrospective uh, testing of samples from patients from these uh, uh, surveillance systems, uh, mortality statistics, um, uh, and a review of excess mortality, but also a request to do cluster analysis on, based on mortality data, a review of patient records, and a detailed uh, analysis of the uh, cases that were identified through this work in December to understand their exposures. So here's one of the, I'm, I'm going to walk you through some of the uh, key findings and everything has been described in the full uh, report. So uh, anyone who has not seen that yet can go there for details. So here is uh, information on the um, question whether or not there was earlier indications of influenza-like illness um, in Wuhan and in other cities in Hubei, Hubei. And as you can see, that was, really was not the case before December, but there was uh, clearly a, a, a steep increase in uh, December. Uh, when asking to retest samples from uh, that type of surveillance um, that was done in uh, with samples collected in October, November, December, not a whole lot uh, in Wuhan, uh, more of them outside of Wuhan, but uh, what was found is that only in uh, January, some of these uh, flu-like illness patients tested positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, a, a separate uh, system is um, 
a disease reporting system that is done by uh, physicians um, um, and where they report fever, uh, influenza-like illness, pneumonia of unknown origin and severe acute respiratory infection. Um, and that again, that, that system was looked at, surveillance system, and you, you again see the increase in signal in December, but be asked for a review of the records from 233 healthcare facilities, and that, that was uh, 76,000 patient records for the months before uh, December. Um, and that was done by clinical teams in those healthcare facilities uh, with the case definitions that had been uh, developed for uh, clinically recognized uh, COVID. That's, of course, a severe case definition um, to see if there were additional cases. And what they came up with was before December 99 suspected uh, pneumonia cases. Um, that were then visited for retesting by serology and none of them are the ones that were still uh, accessible uh, had antibodies. Mind you, these were antibodies, of course, a year later. Um, but, um, well, and at least there is no evidence for earlier circulation there. So this is the summary uh, um, of the cases that were identified with the, the work that was done. So uh, 174 clinically recognized cases, some of those lab confirmed, not all of them. Uh, China in the first weeks used a clinical case definition uh, because there were no diagnostics in place. Um, uh, so that's the group that, uh, that uh, has been looked at to look at early exposures. Um, one of the questions, of course, was uh, were there uh, exposures to the markets? Because what you uh, uh, may recognize is that the first notifications were here, December the 26th, uh, and the first two cases had exposure to uh, the one on uh, fish market, um, which is why in the initial phase, uh, visiting a mark that, that market was part of the case definition. So, of course, the first cases had exposure to that market. But if you then ask that question uh, for the whole group, you see that uh, certainly not so in orange, not everyone had that market exposure. Um, this is a plot of where those 174 uh, original cases were. Here is China, here is uh, the province Hubei, here is the capital Wuhan, and then you can see that, this, that these cases were somewhat localized in the center of Wuhan, and that's also where that, the, that's the area where the market is located. Um, as I said, we visited the um, uh, and spoke to the uh, people that were involved in that initial response. And, and you're looking here at the physician of the uh, uh, Chinese traditional medicine uh, hospital that recognized or that notified the first uh, case, December 26th, and um, that uh, triggered the cascade and brought in the, um, the C Wuhan CDC and then the uh, Ch uh, China CDC for the investigation. So that was uh, in, uh, uh, triggered in this hospital where we also discussed and looked, as we did in all the places where we went, whether they had um, biobanked samples. Uh, but unfortunately, that was not the, this was a fairly basic hospital and they didn't uh, do that. Another, and I think personally quite an important uh, piece of information is the mortality surveillance. So there's a, uh, quite extensive uh, mortality surveillance system uh, that covers around 300 million people and it has quite dense uh, uh, coverage in, uh, in, in Hubei. Um, so that data also was uh, uh, accessed and uh, we asked to do a excess mortality analysis comparing uh, 2019 with the 
the, the three years before. Uh, so this is, well, this is how that is uh, recorded. Uh, the investigation record was translated um, for us. Um, and what you could see is that there was clearly excess mortality in Wuhan in January again, uh, which was not or barely visible in um, uh, outside of Wuhan. Um, and uh, so that was a clear uh, signal. And looking at that by week, uh, you see here and there a small pocket and, and um, the, uh, the teams have gone back to look at what exactly those signals were, but there was nothing, uh, this could be like the, the, the threshold was 50 cases and it was number 51 or something like that. Not, nothing really consistent except starting the third week of 2020. So mid January, where you see the first evidence of excess mortality. And by now we know that that really reflects quite substantial circulation at least several weeks before that. So again, to us, this pointed at quite a substantial circulation, sort of widespread uh, circulation in December, but so far no strong evidence for anything much earlier than that. Um, the, uh, there also has been uh, uh, a lot of discussion on uh, what could have been early amplification events. So um, there, so we looked at large scale events that uh, had to be, uh, that had to get permission from the uh, city uh, and the provincial CDC um, because of the size of the events. And in those events, um, there is a medical team that supports them. So we just, so for the, those events, we also asked uh, for a review of the medical uh, records for, for the on-site medical uh, teams. Um, one of them was the military games that has been a uh, focus of some discussion uh, and some other uh, 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 situations. Um, and we have been uh, told about malaria cases, gastroenteritis cases, some dengue, uh, but no, uh, for instance, pneumonia hospitalizations were registered here, noted here. Um, so then uh, the focus, uh, so in parallel, um, we also asked for a series of studies focusing on the animal side and the market, um, where uh, that started with a full reconstruction of the, the market because well, the market does seem to have played a role um, with uh, a review of potential risk products, uh, supply chain analysis for those, and uh, testing of uh, review of the testing that had been done of livestock and wild animals. And with coupled with that, uh, we have uh, asked to compile and combine and reanalyze any molecular data that was available. And also a lot of the time and effort was put into trying to link that data with, uh, with epi data. And I will talk about that. So this is the market that we also visited. It was still closed and uh, it, um, well, it was good to uh, just be there because there's different stories about the, the quality of the market, but to us, it was really a typical Chinese uh, market with many different small stalls with uh, clear evidence of live animal presence there. Um, um, and with all these little uh, individual uh, food stores, um, not too good ventilation, uh, fairly typical uh, actually. So here's a, a, a map uh, of the, the layout of the market. There's a, a west area and an east area and a big road in between that. And as you can see, the, uh, the majority of the December cases were linked to this uh, side, the west uh, area of the market, whereas visitors really would visit uh, randomly. So that's an indication that something may have happened uh, here. Um, so 
based on that, um, a review was done of all the products that uh, were sold per stall, um, grouped by aquatic products, uh, meat, which is uh, not poultry, so it's, a, it's a weird separation, and wild animal uh, stalls. And here's an example. So this is one, uh, one of those uh, stalls. This is a, uh, uh, here in Chinese and here in, in, in English, which lists, this is a, a, known as the Daohong Wholesale Poultry Stall. Uh, it sold uh, chicken and pheasants, but also snake, bamboo rats, rabbits, and Siamese crocodiles. And those animals came from different parts of uh, 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 China, particularly Southern uh, China. Um, and just by looking at um, all the different types of exposures, it was not really possible to, uh, there was no clear association with one or the other, uh, which if you also look at the mixed profile of products is not too surprising. In, uh, in addition to these uh, more uh, national uh, or regional products, there was also frozen food from uh, 58 countries uh, in the world, which is where the push from China for looking also at the frozen food chain uh, uh, comes from. That's uh, shown here. So there's uh, uh, wholesalers, uh, mostly located in, 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 in southern China, but that, that import products from many parts uh, of the world. And there's direct imports also from uh, other regions. So very complex uh, market system as these uh, markets are. Now you may have seen that just uh, last week uh, a report was published that came as a well somewhat of a surprise, but that really uh, that that had uh, been studying or inventorying from an ecological perspective markets in uh, Wuhan for uh, a period of uh, two years, from May two thousand seventeen till November two thousand nineteen and had uh, found uh, or found evidence for the presence of 47,000 individual animals from 38 species, including 31 protected species. And that did include several of the animal species that we know are susceptible. So it, it included raccoon dogs, um, uh, civet, civet cats, we don't know, but we could suspect they could be susceptible different types of badgers, mink, um, and what have you. Uh, and that, that put them uh, really live animals on the markets until November, 2019. So independent confirmation that this is a serious route to um, investigate. Um, what we also reviewed is all the screening activities that have been done. This is for nucleic acid testing for a range of uh, wild animals, zoo animals, uh, uh, farmed animals from many different sources. Um, that has not yielded any positives. The same was done for the major livestock species where nothing popped up and the same was also done by serology. And so far that has not yielded any um, smoking gun. Uh, then uh, shifting to the molecular data, so um, uh, one activity was the work done by the uh, China Center for Bioinformation, so they compiled all the uh, uh, raw and assembled sequence data uh, that, that have been uh, produced in uh, China throughout the pandemic. Um, and some of that was in the public domain, not all of it. Um, and as you can see, during the early phase, the coverage of sequencing was uh, fairly high. I mean, it's in the, in the range of what we see now in some uh, countries. Um, and what um, uh, we reviewed is uh, where the sequence data uh, came from. So this was a bit of a uh, puzzle. Uh, because it was because there are several uh, sequences out there, uh, sometimes from the same patient, but that's that you know that was not known. 
um, because the practice is that with a, a, re a real unknown disease outbreak, samples are sent to different uh, institutes that then in, well, in competition as these things go, um, generate data and have separately uh, released them. So it was quite a bit of a, an effort to see what sample belonged to whom uh, in the API da database and which sequence belonged to that. And uh, the team has gone back to the raw sequence data to also uh, make sure that there were no uh, mutations that were platform or analysis related. So seemingly simple, but a lot of work. So that's uh, summarized in the uh, report, looking at where the uh, sequences were, who the persons were, what their uh, exposures had been, what their onset dates had been, uh, and so on. And then looking by, uh, by these types of uh, minimum spanning trees at uh, uh, the, the picture. So here you see the, the timeline from earliest to later. Uh, on disease onset dates, that's what this is, um, where you can see that um, already these earlier cases picked up. Um, there is some diversity, so that tells us that um, um, the earliest, now recognized earliest cases really are not the earliest cases, and you would need to go back further to get at the real initial uh, cases and those is who you would want to find and then to really dig out dig deeply into their um, exposures um, of all kinds um, we then also did a reanalysis of the sequence data for the first six weeks so december and uh, january so that's uh, shown here where um, um, you see some, uh, well, interesting observations in that the uh, central clusters here um, already had also, ident you see identical viruses from another uh, pro province here, Zeyang, and there's a cluster of sequences here sitting between these two, uh, which is from yet another uh, province, uh, uh, I always forget the name, Sichuan, um, from which we ha really have very little data. So our recommendation has been to do similar digbacks into the uh, human disease data in these uh, regions, because um, it's, it's hard to know exactly what, uh, what happened here. Um, then there, of course, is the situation with what are the closest known uh, uh, relatives. Um, so far, that continues to be the uh, RATG13 uh, virus that had been um, found based on, on sequencing of samples from um, a certain cave in, in Yunnan. Uh, some uh, expansion now with new sequence data from uh, also bats in Cambodia, more distantly related, and sequence data from uh, two separate uh, uh, groups of pangolin that, that had been seized, uh, suggesting that pangolin also are one natural reservoir host for SARS-related coronaviruses. So in this particular um, uh, full genome based tree provided by Gizate, they look uh, more distant. Uh, if you do uh, recombination analysis, there are parts of the genome where the pangolin viruses are more closely related. And that's shown here. There's a recent paper from, I think, last week um, that has added to the uh, tree of uh, animal coronaviruses uh, here in blue. Uh, finding and, and they have focused on uh, sampling more sampling of bats from Yunnan province um, have found more SARS related coronaviruses that look if you take the whole genome look more distantly related uh, to SARS-CoV-2 than uh, the RITG 13 strain but if you look at um, um, a different, I think this is spike, uh, maybe clo more closely related. Again, 
reflecting the recombination uh, events that are happening that's shown here in the tangogram in this uh, paper just how much uh, recombination there is within these uh, viruses within the animal uh, domain so um, we based on all the, uh, the the studies and data and the visits, um, including to the laboratories. Um, we put together this uh, visual to try and say, okay, what are all the possible uh, routes of introduction that we can think of? Um, and what is our evidence for or against uh, each of those? And um, this is what we have used to, well, in our, uh, to argue that we still think that the most likely route or origin, so the origin of the pandemic is in the animal reservoir, either directly or indirectly. Uh, and there, the, there is a potential for a, a passage through a lab, but um, based on, well, it, it's an evidence discussion. How much evidence can you find for either of them? So we have recommended uh, to uh, take the leads um, and go uh, stepwise further back. So for the human epidemiology, uh, so we've recommended to do uh, wider zero surveys. So what we saw in, in uh, Wuhan and in Hubei is no evidence from the clinical surveillance and the clinical studies for early pockets, but that may be, uh, um, you, you, can, you can still miss them. So we've recommended to do a wide, wide ranging zero survey using blood banked samples from that period, October, November, and to do those in the other uh, regions where there has been the earliest evidence for presence from the molecular data. So that would be uh, Zeyang, Guangdong, I, I forgot to list the, the central province here, but also Italy and Spain. Um, the, yeah, so this is a review of the er, er, earliest cases from that central genetic cluster. Maybe go back with, to that big clinical review with a less stringent case definition because it has been quite stringent. Um, follow the leads back to the wild animal farms um, and particularly because they have been closed, the people working on those um, uh, to see uh, if, if there's anything to be found there. Um, of all the animals screening that has been done, the fur animal farming really is, is missing and that needs to happen. Uh, and we've recommended that uh, service, including neighboring countries. And we've also recommended if there's any new evidence uh, for anything, please share that and it will be taken up in subsequent studies. Um, so that's what I would like to uh, uh, end with. And, it, and the uh, international side of the people that have been uh, involved in this. So uh, with that, um, I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Um, maybe looking at the chat. So a question is, had you reviewed virologic and serological data for the three researchers who got ill and admitted to the hospital? Um, so the uh, answer is uh, no, because this, is, uh, this comes from uh, US intelligence sources, but that has, so we do not know who those people are. And the uh, uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology and China CDC did, could not confirm uh, this. Uh, what we did discuss is uh, the testing program of uh, lab workers uh, for the uh, people that work in the um, facilities um, and uh, what the 
Institute uh, explained is that they have a biannual uh, serology sampling and they have tested all their staff uh, for antibodies and have not found any positives there. So that's what uh, was discussed. Um, then there is, yeah, so what kind of type of investigation was done? Um, so the question uh, there, so what we did is uh, we visited the three laboratories that have been involved in the, um, in the whole initial uh, response. Um, so that was the uh, Wuhan CDC laboratory, um, the uh, provincial CDC uh, lab and the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And in uh, th these three labs, we uh, asked, you know, so we reviewed the, the activities, um, including the research activities. Um, and uh, we uh, reviewed, they are, we discussed their um, training programs, their uh, safety programs, and their uh, health uh, screening programs. Um, and so uh, that, that's uh, the extent to where we discussed that. We also discussed um, the different potential, uh, well, the, the hypothesis. Hmm. We we lost Marian. Um, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So when did you lose me? When you were reporting on the free hospital, you have uh, the free institute you have investigated. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the investigation was, you know, we were a scientific uh, team. So we, we reviewed all the studies that had been done. We reviewed, the, so we, we visited the facilities. We discussed their safety um, um, setup. We discussed their training programs for staff. We discussed their health monitoring for staff. And uh, that did not give any um, indications. Um, we, we were aware of the uh, reports from the uh, US intelligence and, have, and WHO has asked to share those, but that has not happened. So this is a bit of a catch uh, 22 situation. Um, Dr. Fauci called releasing medical records for six researchers in 2012. No, I'm not familiar with those cases. Um, I that this is, Marion, I guess this is related to the story of the uh, mine got in the cave, you see? Yeah, the cave. Yeah. Yeah, so that's um, one that we discussed. Um, and the, so, uh, uh, Professor Sheng Li, she uh, explained to us that they had eventually tested samples from those patients for now with the SARS-CoV-2 um, assays and had not found any positives. Um, I, I do know that there's this uh, master thesis out there which uh, suggests there was IgM, but it's difficult to, to, to know the quality from tests about that. Um, then from a science communications point of view, how can we do better at improving the public discourse around why there is no clear answer to this yes, yet? Yeah, well, anyone who has suggestions there is most welcome. I think we have to keep uh, explaining how the scientific process works, which includes um, uh, that it's a stepwise pro process, that you try to go by step by step uh, working, uh, developing an evidence base or an evidence base against it, that it's 
extremely difficult, if not impossible, to prove a negative. And I think that's the, the discussion or the what we, I think what we need to keep uh, trying to uh, convey. Um, because I do think the, the polarization in this discussion is really not helping. That's my personal <laughs> view. Um, I just continue the, the line of questions here. Yeah? Yes, correct. We have many questions. Yeah, I no problem. <laughs> um, last week, uh, I commented on Twitter that I was not aware of live animals present. Um, it sounds like this was known during your inspection, no? So inspection is the wrong word. Uh, we did not go for an inspection and that's clearly a misunderstanding. That's not what this uh, uh, endeavor was. But, but yes, I, I must say I was annoyed when I saw that paper um, and I looked it up. It had been submitted to the journal uh, in October, 2020. Um, to, so to me, and I've sent out an email a request for information to the authors, to me it's uh, a bit weird that they did not think of coming forward with this information. Um, and it was a, a couple of uh, groups coming at it from the ecology side. So for people that, I'm, so I mentioned that study, so this was uh, looking at presence of wild animals on uh, live wild, wild animals on markets in Wuhan. And that uh, study came out last week, um, but already that information of course was out there mid last year, if not earlier. Um, yeah, so to me, it's a bit surprising that uh, this in, did, it was a, a group of authors from China, from UK and from Canada. So to me, it's, uh, a little bit astonishing that that wasn't shared earlier, but um, that's what it was. It did not, because what we did discuss is, because uh, there are several team members that are very familiar with uh, working on uh, markets in uh, China. So we did discuss that, uh, so there were live animals on the market, that was clear. Um, we did uh, discuss uh, that, we did discuss that as a risk factor, but just having that, you know, piece of evidence up until November on the table would, yeah, would have been useful. Um, why the delay on testing fur farms? Um, yes, I, well, that's, that's difficult to know. So there has been uh, testing of fur farms. Um, so I think it's important to um, uh, recognize how this was done. So the the uh, so what happened is quite extensive testing of animals. More than eighty thousand uh, specimens were processed from many different animal species, uh, but that does not equal a very systematic survey to rule out certain species. So yes, mink were included in the testing, but not to a, to a degree and a sample size and a, where you could say you can rule them out. So that's uh, what we have suggested. And that's ruling in is relatively easy, um, but ruling out is more difficult. So we have suggested uh, surveys, including serology in uh, some of the newly recognized susceptible animal species to, well, take those off the chart or on the chart. Question, were lab books available? Uh, they, we did not ask for lab books. Um, so this is this distinction between an inspection versus a scientific uh, mission. Um, so, and then question, do conditions that led to the zoonotic spread of SARS-CoV-2 still exist? Uh, if so, how do we limit them? Um, yeah, so that's of course a big question. So 
um, if you think of um, a bad reservoir, the question is, uh, uh, are these viruses present in bat in a, you know, a form that is uh, human transmissible, then this is an event waiting to happen again. If there has been an intermediary host, the question is whether that was an accidental local uh, you know, wild animal small scale event, or if there is a con continuing simmering problem. Personally, I think the latter is less likely because there has been a resurgences in China, uh, but none of them. So the ones that were, were I've seen sequence information um, had sequences from uh, th that were not close to the root of the original virus, which is what you would expect to see then. So I don't think, and also now the recent Guangdong outbreak was with the Delta variant. So I don't think um, that's going on. Um, so the review of research projects were from self-reporting, uh, that's correct. So uh, self-reporting uh, with, with, so looking at the data, uh, looking at the analysis, asking to reanalyze, discussing the data and uh, so on. Um, did you request COVID-19 screening from archival samples to all countries for investigation? Um, like all 2018, 2019 or earlier archive samples from humans with respiratory symptoms. Um, well, that's a very broad uh, one. Uh, so what we did say, so for instance, there, ha there are now a few reports out, so actually and sequence data out very from November from Italy. Um, it's not entirely clear, it's partial uh, sequence data, it's not entirely clear what that is, but um, like we said, it, you would want to have a deeper serological uh, uh, investigation to look for smaller clusters in uh, Wuhan and Hubei, you would also want that in other places which had the earliest evidence of cases either from the notifications or from studies later on. So there's that there's two or three reports from Italy. There's a uh, report from France that found increasing serial conversions in December already uh, or late November. So those regions are where you would also want to ideally do a comparative study with comparable methods because that's um, Um, do you know if the Wuhan Institute of Virology was conducting gain of function research? So they did present their work where they are looking for um, human cell binding of um, spikes of different bat viruses uh, using a, um, a backbone that I don't no, exactly now, but that's certainly the distances away from uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, yeah, and so I think we're all going into the, the lab hypothesis, which is understandable given the US focus, but um, uh, I would suggest really people to, to read the report on what we did uh, and did not do. Um, and the, so a big thing here is that um, I think there's a misunderstanding that this, this is not an inspection. We had a meeting with scientists. Um, we have requested uh, a whole series of studies. Uh, we have reviewed data generated by a thousand people. <laughs> and that's what we reviewed and looked at and summarized and concluded on. Um, 
and uh, we have asked for evidence for the other theories that so if if there were a, an early pocket of cases in November coming up from the serology, we would go in there and really look at where, what were the exposures of those people, including do they have lab exposures? Uh, what exactly uh, are their risk factors? Um, but if you don't have any of that, it's very difficult to, to discuss these uh, lab hypotheses. Um, there's a question about furin cleavage um, in relation to the claim of a gain of function experiment. Uh, well, there's now a, a virus from another, uh, from a wild animal source that also has this, uh, or has uh, some positions that, that, that uh, uh, confer cleavability. Um, so that's, and that's written up in, uh, I think, initial in, in Christian Anderson's paper, and there's a recent, more recent uh, paper that also looked at that. Um, as a scientist, do you think we should be using this to take seriously the risk of what could happen if there was a lab outbreak? Uh, yes, of course, I think it's critical. Um, I also, and I think, so just to be clear, we did put the lab, uh, potential lab uh, leak hypothesis on the agenda. It was not there initially. We made a point of also discussing that and we did discuss that at length with the people in the different labs. Um, but it is also, um, you know, it's, it's virtually, so unless you do like a, an inspection, and even then I, I doubt that you would find um, different things. Um, it is, so there's a, there's a question in my mind, what is the best way of getting as far as possible into understanding what really happened. And uh, my position in this is it's better to try and work this through really step by step with full diplomacy, with you know working towards an understanding. It's critical that we know, but um, I also think this has become very difficult because of the accusations early on. So it's a very difficult field to work in currently, in my view. But as a scientist, I think we should, and I've, I've recommended that, make uh, missions like this a routine. Whether there's an outbreak in the US, visit that and come in and discuss it. If it's in the Netherlands, do the same. If it's in China, do the same. Make it a routine. Uh, so that, that takes away some of the uh, um, geopolitical angle of it. Um, what else? In human transmission is primarily aerosols, like droplets, I guess, <laughs> from animal to humans. How was the route of transmission? Or from animal reservoirs? Well, I think that's a big question, Mark. Um, this is something, for instance, we've been looking at in our mink uh, uh, farm outbreaks, where you see human to mink, to mink to human, to cat to dog uh, transmission. And if you study that, it's so it's really difficult to know what actually really makes the virus, what transmits the virus. So these are quite heavily contaminated environments. Um, so we've looked at the animals and you find a virus, of course, in the throats, but also in the stools, you find highly contaminated bedding, you find dust that tests positive, you find air samples, which are droplets and dust, 
that test positive. So it's very difficult to know exactly, and you have then infected people. It's really difficult to know, you know, how that mode of transmission then is, um, and if, if not a mixture, in my view. But. Okay, moviegoers are given the impression that finding patient zero in an outbreak is vitally important. Is it? Would it have changed the public health response? Um, it, I don't think it would have changed the public health response, except if the first case was found was a lab worker, for instance. Um, but the public health response is what it is. It is trying to identify cases, working with the case definition, trying to diagnose them, trying to contain um, and, and you don't really need to know where it started to do that. Where it started is important for, you know, academically, but also to see if there's a continuing source. But that, well, we haven't seen uh, new sparks with the same original viruses so far. So, um, so that maybe it's not so much of a problem. Um, and the case finding patient zero, I think is very difficult. If you have an infection pyramid like, like this, we don't know for sure that the infection pyramid at, at the beginning was the same. So, so now we see, of course, there's a mix of asymptomatic, very mild to very severe cases. Um, and if you have such a small tip of the pyramid that's severe, it's very difficult to find patient zero. It's easier actually if, if you know, in an Ebola situation when, when the majority of cases gets severely ill. So, but that's where maybe, maybe doing very granular serology could help. If you have like a small pocket in a village, um, of people that have zero converted, that maybe could help. Um, so that's why that's what we recommended. Um, I'm just going on, right? <laughs> Are there archived wastewater samples that could be analyzed? Um, so unfortunately, no, there is a system for, we, we, we track that, but there's a system for sewage water testing for polio uh, but those samples are only stored for a month so that was unfortunate there was some wastewater testing as part of the market investigation um, so the initial market uh, investigation that was done by the uh, china cdc and they had very heavily contaminated environmental samples which uh, is to me, um, you know, I think that's difficult to explain from just people, because if we look, so for instance, we've been doing environmental testing studies, um, with, which uh, involved uh, like in hospital wards or, or other settings, and it's very difficult to find uh, positive environmental samples. So here, the, the, the loads were so high that the, that the sewage samples actually, or the, these were not sewage, but drainage samples from the market uh, yielded full genomes. So to me, that is that sounds like pretty heavy uh, contamination. So hard to know, uh, although maybe some, some behavioral aspects <coughs> like, like, like spitting could have been uh, part of that. Uh, question, why do you think China was so efficient at controlling? Um, well, I so just seeing one year after that initial outbreak, how stringent the quarantine still was also that that was not just for us, that was also uh, traveling back. Um, the um, uh, seeing that you cannot take a flight without a QR code reflecting a recent PCR result, things like that, a year after 
well, more or less containment. So, so it's very stringent uh, quarantine, that's one. But um, I think we also have to think about, uh, we, we have seen a step increase in transmissibility with the 614 mutation, which, which was rare in the uh, Asian, early Asian viruses, but was seen uh, with a seeding in Europe and beyond. So there actually also is, in my mind at least, the hypothesis that it wasn't as transmissible then as it has become after that. So two, two things. Um, uh, I think we have time for about one more question. All right. We will, uh, we will finish Kevin's uh, these two questions. I mean, okay. Maria, you have a great success. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I would like to know your opinion about the real chance that the scientific community has to trace the origin of the virus at the moment. Um, I would say that depends on how we proceed with the discussion on um, inspection versus further studies. Um, because it's um, currently the, the, all the phase two studies are on hold because of the lab lead discussion, um, which is a bit unfortunate. So I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I think it really depends on whether ways can be found to take those uh, further um, in a manner that is, you know, that gives access we cannot do studies if there's no access. So that's easy enough. Um, then the last one, the public perception is that there are issues with conflict of interest uh, for Peter Daszak. I can also say myself because that came up because our lab has done gain of function study. Um, in the future, have there been discussions about making sure uh, all team members are clear of these conflicts, uh, so there will be less questions. And do you have any recommendations? Um, yeah, I well, the full CVs of all the team members have been scrutinized and they were not considered to be conflicts. So, um, and uh, I think, yeah, so based on, on, on this uh, experience, um, question is whether you should also include some of the political um, evaluations, because if you have, and this is a, if you have a political team composition, you have different teams, I think. Uh, so that's a bit of a question mark. What I can say is that the team consisted of good scientists <laughs> um, and the public perception of the whole situation, of course, is in part also fed by what is out there um, in terms of debates in media, but also among scientists. And I think that's where we need to focus our work. Be transparent about how difficult these endeavors are, what you can and cannot do but also uh, how we can take this forward without it becoming a big uh, sort of political clash, because that's certainly not helping us move forward. Well, thank you so much, man. You see, you <laughs> it came as no surprise that you received a lot of questions, but I was not expecting so many. And thank you so much, because you really gave a very clear overview and uh, very honest, I would say, and science-driven, and that's exactly the spirit of a GVN uh, webinar. So thank you so much to the, all the attendees. Thank you for your questions. And thank you again, Marion, for a great talk. Bye-bye.